I'm going to introduce you to Bev. So this is Bev. She's an Ophiocordyceps that has infected a tarantula. Bev is just our affectionate name for this specimen. Underneath our feet, in this unassuming corner of Kew Gardens, is the oldest, biggest, and most scientifically important collection of dried fungi on Earth. Today, we're going to go into the fungarium and pull out some specimens from the UK. Let's dig deeper. Hi, my name is Alex, and I'm a curator mycologist here in the fungarium at Kew. The fungarium is so important because it's basically a record of hundreds of years of fungal collections through space and time. And if we lost the fungarium, we'd be losing that, and it's quite precious. And as a curator, I'm kind of similar to a librarian in that I take care of all the species. When we get new things in, I database them, I package them, I put them into sheets, and I put them in boxes. I'm going to show you the biggest specimen we have. This is Felinus. So Felinus is a bracket fungus that grows on trees and it gets really, really big. They get incredibly woody. So this here is a polypore fungus and polypore means many pores. You have many, many tubes here that make up pores where spores come out of the bottom. I think what people would find surprising about fungi in the UK is that British fungi can be just as exotic looking and cool and interesting as tropical fungi. And there's a lot of things that you wouldn't expect to see in a temperate region like the UK that would blow your mind that they exist here. We are in the library of the Fungarium at Kew, and I'm here with my fellow curator mycologists, Izzy and Rosie. Fungi are not plants or animals, they're their own kingdom. However, fungi are more closely related to animals than plants. So a fruiting body is the reproductive part of a fungus. Um, they can look like this, or they can look like these. So there's lots of diversity in how a fruiting body will look, but it is how a mushroom reproduces. And a lot of the kind of body of a fungus you don't see. It's mycelium, and it can be underground, it can be in a substrate like a tree, or whatever the fungus is growing on. Um, the mycelium is a little bit more invisible, but when the fungus is ready to reproduce, it will make a fruiting body, which is usually what you're seeing. Yeah, and most of what we have in the fungarium is dried fruiting bodies because that's what people are able to collect and dry. Q has 1.3 million specimens here in the fungarium, and obviously we'd love to show you them all, but we can't. So instead we've picked a few of our favorites from the UK. Uh, let's start with devil's fingers. Rosie? Okay, so this is a fungus called Clathrus archeri, um, and it gets its name, I mean, you can kind of see, it looks a little bit like fingers. These grow basically from something that looks like an egg. This is, you it's can see the egg one. quite nicely here. Yeah, it's a really cute little baby. They hatch and these kind of tentacles ooze out. They're kind of bright pink or red and they're covered in this slimy, gungy like substance, which is called gleba. And the thought is that this fungus smells really bad. Um, and we think that maybe it's to attract flies, which will land on the sticky gleba, and they get covered in spores, and then they fly away, and they might um, spread the spores that way. I can't believe that these grow in England or in on they Earth. Just look so <laughs> They're so weird. <laughs> but when you see them, it is kind of like a whoa, what is that? And then you smell them, and you're like. The smell cannot be understated. We no. were carrying them with us, and yeah. we were all taking in turns and holding them as far away as we could. <laughs> yeah. The interesting thing about this fungus is it's found in the UK, it grows here on Kew Gardens, um, but we think maybe it came in on wool um, during the, the war because it's native ranges in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I find fungi so interesting because they're just kind of different from plants and animals that most people think of when you're thinking about biodiversity or wildlife. Most people are thinking of mammals, of trees, of these big things but really fungi are underpinning a lot of what's going on in the ecosystem. And I think they're kind of the unsung heroes. Next, we're gonna do green elf cup, which is one of Rosie's favorites. Yeah, um, so the green elf cup is an ascomycete. Um, most people normally think of fungi, they think of mushrooms with gills, but ascomycetes are really variable. And um, sometimes they are cups like this one, little cups that grow on wood. Um, and you can see probably from there, that this fungus is this beautiful green blue color and it stains the wood this color. So it's quite easy to spot the wood with this stain. It grows in the UK as well. Yeah, whenever we're in a forest, which we sometimes go to forests together, <laughs> um, 
what I like to do in the forest is anytime I see wood with that green blue stain I'll just like turn over all of the logs and look for those little cups um, and it's kind of like a treasure hunt and when you find them it's super exciting because you don't see them as much as you see the stained wood and it's been used historically and also like up to modern day um, when people make things out of wood they cut thin slices of this like stained wood because it keeps it stained and it's really beautiful mm -hmm. yeah and we're actually going to be visiting the VNA soon to try yeah. to uncover a little bit of mystery about Chlorosporia stained wood, which Izzy is kind of been spearheading. So we're working with um, wood specialists here at Kew, and we're hopefully going to go visit a cabinet at the VNA, which has um, beautiful inlay design, some of which um, is green, and they want to know if it is the fungus staining the wood or if it has been stained after the fact. So if someone collects a fungus um, out there in the big wide world and they want to give it to us in the fungarium, the first thing they'll do is collect it, collect some metadata about the fungus, where they found it, the date, who they are, that sort of stuff, and then they'll dry it using a food dehydrator and they can send it to us. Mm -hmm. Once it comes to us, the first thing we're going to do is freeze it. So anything that's incoming, we freeze, and it's not to kill the fungus or anything like that. The fungus is probably already dead. Um, it's more to prevent pests from coming down into the fungarium, because lots and lots of bugs love to eat fungi and love to live inside fungi and then come out later. Mm -hmm. So the freezing gets rid of all the pests. Um, then once we bring it down here, then we do databasing, which mm -hmm. is not our favorite task. <laughs> sometimes it's just what you need. Yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. it's relaxing. Um, and databasing is just digitizing all the data that came in. So who collected it, what the fungus is, how they ID'd it, um, the date, the location, the country. Substrate. Substrate. No, I, I think, think that's our favorite. We love the substrate. Yeah. We have a drop down menu where you can choose substrates and qualifiers. So it can be like mossy log. Yeah. Or damp can, ground. It's quite a <laughs> <laughs> We made a Leech. horoscope thing with it, where yeah. you can put your, like, your, your birthday in, and then you get your substrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the boxes that they're stored in. They're all green. A lovely shade of green, I think. And then everything is stored in folders. So we start off with um, an outer folder, which generally will hold a genus. All these packets are glued to the sheet here for storage. And inside each packet, you have a glass scene. And inside the glass scene will be the fungus. So if things are a bit too big for a packet, we store them in boxes. So this is a lichen that has been boxed. And additionally with lichens, we tend to uh, mount them in a material called plaster soap and cut out little wells so that they don't rattle around and bash against each other and damage the uh, fruiting body. This is one of our favorite specimens in the fungarium. It's a type specimen, which is important because it is the reference for this species, and this species is the wavy cap, which is Psilocybe cyanescens. Um, do you, one of you want to talk about Elsie Wakefield, who described this species? Well, can you first tell me why Psilocybe is an interesting so genus? So, many people know about <laughs> Psilocybe because they are psychoactive. There's been a lot in the news recently. People are trying to use them for therapeutic use. It's very much a a hot topic a lot is a lot of uh, study being done on it and there's still a lot of unknowns about it though so they're super pretty too they, they're so cute <laughs> wavy caps because they have this kind of undulating wavy cap and they also have like a blue stain when you cut them which is really pretty but this yeah. uh, species of psilocybe in particular means quite a lot to Q because it, it was described by the first female head of mycology at Q, Elsie Wakefield and the earliest specimen we have is 1911. Yeah. And the blue staining that this gets on the fungus is an example of a character that's really important to write down if you ever collect fungi. Things like their smell, staining, and how they look when fresh are really important to write down because once they're dried, they kind of just look like little bits, kind of hard to see, but they just become very dried and tiny. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to define what is a native species in the UK because fungi have been historically understudied compared to things like plants. And it's hard to know sometimes if something has always been in the UK or if it was introduced. Um, but there's certain things that we feel pretty sure about. So like, for example, we feel pretty sure Chlorosaboria has been here for a very long time. Um, it doesn't seem to be invasive. It doesn't seem to be non-native. But on the other hand, we know that something like Devil's Fingers or the Clathyrus artri was introduced from New Zealand or Australia. 
So if people are interested in fungi and want to learn more, there's some networks out there that they can look into. So there's the British Mycological Society. Q has a very strong relationship with them. What we would love to see from the public is more people to be engaged and interested in fungi because they're under-recorded when you compare to mammals, other animals, plants. Fungi are definitely under-recorded and getting more people out there looking at fungi, interested in them and interested in protecting their habitats um, would be great to see. We need more mycologists, definitely. Yeah, yeah. more do, mycologists. Yeah. Do a PhD. <laughs> Join us. Join us. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Dig Deeper. If you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to learn more about the work that Q does, visit our website for more information.